Okay, so I'm going to skip Genesis 38 and jump into Genesis 39 just so we can finish Joseph's journey. But I'm going to circle back. So 38 is going to come after 39 in the lineup, but it'll make sense in a second. So um, we have just covered Genesis 37 in full. It's a lot, long video, but we made it. So Genesis 37 takes us through Joseph's journey from his father's house to Egypt. And so in chapter 39, still in Genesis, first book of the Bible, but chapter 39 picks up where he lands in Egypt. And then chapter 38 is a separate story about a separate person that I'm going to cover separately, but we're going to finish this journey today. So in 39, it starts off and says that Joseph was brought down to Egypt and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, brought him from the hands of the Ishmaelites or Midianites um, that had brought him into Egypt. See how we had to skip till we get right to right where we left off in 37 is right where we pick up in 38. And it says that the Lord was with Joseph. The Lord was with Joseph. Before we get into anything that happens at this point, God is with him. Please remember it doesn't matter what you go through. It doesn't matter where you've been. It doesn't matter how people have treated you. God is with you. The Lord is with you. He is working out a plan for your life. It is hard. His brothers hated him. His own family hated him. They sold him into slavery. And that's only because somebody talked them out of killing him. The Lord is with you. And it says that he was a prosperous man. And he was brought to the master of his Egyptians the master of the Egyptians. So he is brought to Potiphar. He is brought to the head of his household. He comes in as a slave. He learns his trade. He's real good at it. And God continues to exalt him and, and give him position and give him power and authority. And he moves up in the ranks. And so he is brought before the master of this house, the owner of this house to, um, to, to talk to him and see what he can do for him. Because at this point, if you have somebody, if everything they touch turns to gold, they make money on every attempt that they try. You know, they are successful in everything that they do. It doesn't matter if you are a successful janitor, they're going to move you. You, the, you you're, you're, the Lord will make you be noticed. And so that's what we see here. And so Potiphar sees that he is successful, that he is hardworking, that he is dedicated, that he, wherever he touches, there's a blessing on it. And so Joseph finds grace in his sight. So now he like him. He like him and he going to treat him well. And so what he does is he put him in verse four. It says that he made him overseer over his house and all that he had put into his hands. So he gives him from a regular slave whose job is probably to sweep the floor or, you know, take care of some animals, um, you know, to, to work. He's being promoted to the head. He's being promoted to literally second to Potiphar only. As in, he is the person that runs the whole ship, runs the whole house. And this man can leave the house and go out into battle, go meet with Pharaoh, have, you know, do whatever, training exercises. He can go and train the soldiers for Egypt. He can go do all these things. And he knows that Joseph is going to take care of his house and it's going to run the way it's supposed to run. The money that's supposed to be there is going to be collected. They're going to buy fields. They're going to grow food. They're going to do whatever needs to happen. It's all going to be taken care of because Joseph is powerful, is successful, and he's in command. And so um, he puts him over everything. And then in verse 6, in verse 6, it says, Joseph was a goodly person and well-favored. Um, he's been, he is being blessed by the Lord. The Lord is with him and the Lord is allowing, is allowing this favor to shine on him. And he has not only God's favor, but he has man's favor. And so in verse seven, it says, and it came to pass. Typically when you see, and it came to pass in the Bible, that's like what had happened was, all right, so boom, girl, let me tell you, that's what that is with those words mean. And it came to pass. I mean, after a time, after a period of time has passed, this is when it got good. After a certain period of time, here's what happened. Um, and so it says that the master's wife cast her eyes upon Joseph and said, lie with me. She decided this man is powerful. He is attractive and he is around and she wanted her a little sample. And so she said, come lie with me. 
hey, 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 my man ain't home. Come see me, man. Come see me. Um, <clears throat> and in verse 8, he refused. The end. He refused. And he said, nope, not at all. Not at all. This man has trusted me with everything in his house. I wish I would betray that trust. But you, friend? Nah, I'm good, homie. <laughs> and so, um, and he explains to her, like, there's nothing he said I can't have. There's nothing in this house that I can't do. I don't move like a slave. I don't. I don't move like a slave in here. I move like somebody who has command. And because of this command, there's nobody else in here that's over me. I don't answer to nobody but him. I answer to myself and him. In fact, everybody else answers to me. Slave and free, they answer to me. I'm in charge. And so, no, I cannot. I cannot. I can't sin against my God, let alone this man. I can't sin against my God, let alone your husband. And we got to remember that sometimes. When stuff gets tempting, when there are things that we want to do that we shouldn't be part of, we got to stop looking at it as, oh, I mean, ain't nobody going to see me. God saw you. Oh, and, and, you know, it's, it, it's okay because I'm going to repent. It's all right. God is, he, he, he really is going to accept your repentance if it's true, if it's real. But we got to be more afraid of sinning against God. Like, I remember I would go out, like, to dinner after church with, you know, family members, church members, you know, just, it, we get together afterwards, a little extra fellowship. And so we would go out and sometimes people would order drinks. And if a minister or a pastor walked in, whether it was your pastor or somebody else's, you just recognized the pastor from a church, walked in, you had a drink in front of you, everybody started pushing their drinks away because they didn't want the pastor to see him drinking. If you're going to do it in front of God, why are you worried about this man? We got to stop being so easy to sin in front of God and worry about the eyes of men. Just because you can look him in the eye doesn't mean that God's not looking at you. He with you everywhere you go. It started off and the Lord was with him. The Lord is with him while he's saying no. The Lord is with you while you're doing the stuff that you're doing. Remember, everywhere you go, you take the Holy Spirit with you. He, The Holy Spirit lives inside of you. You take the Holy Spirit with you everywhere you go, everything you do. So be careful and be aware. And so it says <laughs> um, in verse 10 that it came to pass that she came after him day by day. Every day she tried. Every day she tried. He would go in the house to take care of stuff. She would be in there. So he, he, he it, was, it was a problem. Like she was a nuisance. And so it finally says that he went in the house to take care of some business. And none of the men of the house were in there. She had sent everybody away, probably. She had cleared house. Hey, y'all go work outside in the field. We're good. We don't need nothing in here. And so she realizes that they are home alone. And she tries them now. Like, there's no witnesses. There's nobody around. And so now she can push up a little harder. Before, she would have to kind of pass him a note. She would have to look at him a little bit, whisper in his ear as she walks past. Now nobody's home. She can reach out and touch him. And she does. And it says that she caught him by his garment saying, lie with me. And he left his garment in her hand and fled and got him out. He got out of there. He took, like, if she grabbed him by the jacket, she he shimmied out that jacket and kept it moving. He still had on the rest of his clothes. He wasn't naked. Like, he didn't, this, this is not a space to say that they was laid up and he was like, oh, I can't do this and got up and ran out. no. No, no, no. He is in the kitchen trying to make sure they got enough beans and barley for, you know, the next couple of weeks of dinner. And she catch him by the back of the jacket. And he was like, nope, not even going to touch it. He slid out of that <laughs> and got on down. So and got out of there. He left. He ran away. Now, he is still fully dressed. Otherwise, she just got him by like his jacket or something. Nothing crazy. He's still dressed. And so in verse 13, it says, and it came to pass. All right, so what had happened was when she saw that he left his garment in her hand and ran, she called out to the men of the house. She recognizes that she's alone and now she can play it to her advantage because she's reached out and touched him. If he tells, she's in trouble, like big trouble. So before this can get out, she got to clean this thing up and make herself look like the victim. 
Y'all know what that pause means. So she calls out to the men of the house who aren't there and was like, hey, that Hebrew boy y'all brought in here that, um, that's that been in here and y'all let him take over all this stuff. He came in here and he tried to get me. He tried to get me. He was trying to set me up. He was trying to take my goodies because wasn't nobody in the house. And she basically cries rape here. And says that he attempted to assault me and I screamed and he got scared and he ran. Here's my proof. He left his clothes behind. He was getting naked in here and I screamed and he took off without getting his clothes back. She lies. This is a lie. We are told what happened first and then she lies. Um, and so in verse 18, and it came to pass, she's saying, okay, nope, nope, that won't even the worst part. Catch this one. That won't, that won't at all. Catch, catch what happened next. And it says, <clears throat> and so it says that, that she said that she lifted up her voice and he left his garment and held it up. And when his master heard the words of his wife, after this manner did the servant to me that his wrath was kindled. What that means is that when you kindle a fire, you it starts to it's a little blaze that starts to grow. And so <clears throat> his anger was a little blaze that started to grow. And so what it's saying is she said, here's his garment. Her husband heard about it. And he was like, this dude I put in charge of everything tried to hurt my wife. Because he didn't even consider that his wife would be lying. Did not even consider that. Didn't even consider it. Now, verse 19 says that his wrath was kindled. She lied. In verse 20, it says Joseph's master took him and put him in prison. I don't see that there was a trial. I don't see that anybody asked Joseph what happened. They ain't test nothing. They None of that. None of it. He just went straight to jail. Verse 20, and Joseph's master took him and put him in prison, the place where the king's prisoners were bound, and he was there in prison. So again, there was, his father sent him to one place to go meet his brothers. On his way there, there was a certain man. We see this in chapter 37. There was a certain man that redirected him and sent him to the place where he was supposed to be, where his brothers actually were. He gets there, his brothers are plotting on him, put him in a pit, sell him into slavery. Slay, the, the, the slavery moves him directly to Egypt. He didn't have a ride for e to Egypt if he had gotten somewhere else. He did not have the path to where he was trying to get to without this. Now, he has now been sent to prison. He is not sent to regular jail. He is sent to the place where the kings or Pharaoh's prisoners are. That is a separate jail. He is not down here in Jim. He's not in, in, in Jim Pop. He in, he in, like, he in a special setup. He, he in one of those Martha Stewart kind of jails. Like he's in a different place. This is the place for the king's prisoners. Meaning these are people who will have met the king. These are prisoners who will have had some interaction with the Pharaoh. These are prisoners who have a, they're a different group of people than somebody who was out in the market stealing apples and bread. Aladdin wouldn't be here, but Prince Ali would. That's, that's the difference. Okay. So... <clears throat> It says in verse 21, but the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy. How do you see mercy in prison? How do you see mercy in prison as an innocent man? There was no trial. There was no question. He just went to jail. And it says the Lord was with him and showed him mercy. And gave him favor. So again, he has come in. He was a slave who got promoted up to literally the second in command in this man's house and goes into prison and God's favor is still on him. He's still successful. He's still great at what he's doing and he is he is moving up in the ranks of the prison and becomes a favored person. He has God's favor that rests on him that gives him man's favor. And so they make him the keeper of the prison. He is now in charge of the prisoners. He is a prisoner, but he is in charge of the prisoners as well. So he moves a little differently than they do. And it says in verse, sorry, I turned that page real quick. Um, so it says in verse 23, the keeper of the prison looked not 
anything that was under his hand because the Lord was with him and that which he did, the Lord made it prosper. Literally, God made him successful in what he was doing. He made him so successful that they didn't even check up after him. There was no micromanaging for him. Even in prison, he had favor. It is hard to see favor in prison. It is hard to see it in your own life when you are in these prisonous situations. You got that job you cannot seem to get out of, but you managed to get a little commission here and there. You managed to get the free lunch. You managed to win the customer service award. You met, It's a job that you hate going to. It's a job that you don't want to have. And if you could get out of there, you would. But somehow in the midst of it, you get t- you get little you get a little favor. They keep making you, you 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 know you may not be the official supervisor, but you are definitely the person that everybody comes to. You may not carry the title, but for some reason when they do all the layoffs and structure restructurings and things that they do, you don't seem to go anywhere. You have favor in that position. They don't even check your work no more. They just trust that it's good. They don't even say, okay, but we're going to hire a trainer. No, just go ahead and train this person. You training your supervisors. It's favor. Because they know that you're capable of it. They know that you got it. And they can trust in it. Even when you hate being in that position. So, recap on um, recap on chapter 39. So, I skipped chapter 38. It's going to be a separate video. It's going to come up soon. But, um, chapter 39. Joseph lands in Egypt. He is taken to Potiphar's house. He works his way up. The Lord is with him and he has God's favor. And because he has God's favor, he has man's favor as well. He works and works and works and becomes literally the overseer of this man's house. This man is a high ranking military official. He literally has a whole lot of stuff going on. He becomes like his executive assistant. He can make decisions. He can make executive decisions on his behalf. So he's taking care of this house. He's running it as though it's his. And this man, Potiphar's wife, she get she gets to act in a fool and tries to seduce him. It doesn't work. So she waits until one day when nobody else is around. She's trying to snatch him up, make him make it happen, and he runs. And because now she's embarrassed because she has um, his clothing in her hands and now she has to explain why this is here she has to explain if he gets to the people before she does she could be in very big trouble up to and um including possibly losing her life for these actions so she gets so she screams and cries and calls all the people and points out that this man has tried to assault her and lies flat out lies on him and her husband doesn't ask any questions just take that man straight to jail which is probably good um, because who knows what this man could have been capable of. He's he's a high-ranking official in the military. He might have took some, you know, he might have done a little vigilante justice here, but he takes him to prison. But he puts him in the prison where Pharaoh's prisoners are, not where everybody else's prisoners are. So he's in, in that space. Joseph is again favored. He carries God's favor. The Lord is with him. He carries God's favor and as such gets man's favor. And it's now put in charge of the prison. And so now he's in charge of the prisoners and what happens and how they eat and how they exercise and whatever else is going on. And so he's in a preferred position there. And it says that everything that he did, the Lord makes it prosper. That's where this chapter ends. That which he did, the Lord made it prosper. I pray that God make you prosperous. I pray that everything that you touch prospers. I pray that everything that you are a part of, uh, everything that you are supposed to be a part of. Because <laughs> sometimes we be mixed up in some foolishness, but you can't ask for God's favor on foolishness. You got to ask for God's favor on getting out of the foolishness. And I pray that even in your prison-like situations, that you are granted favor. Y'all be blessed.